The NBA season tips off in less than two weeks, and a lot has changed since we last saw these teams. Bradley Beal is now on the Suns, Fred Van Vliet is on the Rockets, Chris Paul somehow ended up in Golden State, and we have this new 7'4 rookie that's supposedly going to be one of the greatest players ever. That's without mentioning that four coaches who have made the NBA Finals in the last five seasons are now with new teams, and for the second year in a row, we don't have a clear-cut favorite to win the Larry O'Brien. But before we get to crowning an NBA champion, we have 82 regular season games to play. So today, we're going to go through and predict the Western Conference standings. At the 15th seed, I have the Utah Jazz. It's hard to say that one team will be the worst in their respective conference, because anything can happen on any given night. But talent-wise, the Jazz have one of the five worst cores in the NBA. On the positive side, I'm a firm believer that Lori Markkinen will continue to see success as a number one option, and the addition of John Collins could prove to be valuable if he shows up in 2021 playoff form. Their 2023 draft was one of my favorites, as adding a versatile forward in Taylor Hendricks and one of my favorite prospects, Keontae George, will prove to be a great addition. But I'm concerned about their guard play. Colin Sexton and Jordan Clarkson aren't my ideal backcourt, both defensively and offensively. And yes, both Sexton and Clarkson are great scorers and a threat to shoot from all three levels. But does that matter if they can't defend and can't play make at an average level? There's a lot of young talent on this team, but I'm confident in saying that the Jazz will finish in the bottom three of the Western Conference. At the 14th seed, I have the Portland Trailblazers. There's a lot of potential with this Trailblazers team after trading Dame to the Milwaukee Bucks. Second overall pick Scoot Henderson will have the keys to this offense and lead this young core, headlined by Shaden Sharp and DeAndre Ayton. There's not much to say about this team other than the fact that they're young and will probably get a couple wins over a top contender that will make us even more excited for this quarter reach of their prime. There's an extremely small chance they make the play-in, but I think it's more likely they finish near the bottom of the conference come the end of the season. At the 13th seed, I have the San Antonio Spurs. As I mentioned before, the 7'4 alien Victor Wembanyama is now in the NBA, but there's still a lot of question marks around him and the Spurs. There's a world where Victor struggles to adjust to the NBA's pace, but there's also a world where Victor dominates and leads the Spurs to the play-in. But the fate of the Spurs will rest on how Devin Vassell and Keldon Johnson operate as second and third options. There are signs of Vassell being the second best guy on a solid playoff team, but I need to see him develop a little more isolation scoring skills before I'm able to say that. And Keldon Johnson has already shown he can score 20 a game on good efficiency, but is he willing to take a step back for the younger stars to show out? A lot of this ranking is dependent on how these three young stars play, but I believe they will show out in their first year and win somewhere between 30 and 35 games. There's a chance they sneak into the play-in, but I wouldn't bet on it. At the 12th seed, I have the Houston Rockets. The Rockets added some solid veterans this offseason in Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, and drafted one of my favorite prospects in last year's draft, Amen Thompson. We get to see Jalen Green progress as a number two option, and watch the Jabari Smith and Alperin Shengun front court continue to develop. There's a lot of young talent on this team, with six of this team's top eight guys drafted within the last three seasons. But will this young talent finally translate to winning? The Western Conference has some stiff competition this season, and it's fair to say that almost every team in the West wants to make the play-in. So how can this youthful team make it to the play-in? The two keys are Fred Van Vliet and Ime Udoka. Both were pieces that helped their respective team make it to the NBA Finals. They have playoff experience and understand what it takes for a team to win when it counts. If both of these guys bring their A game, the Rockets have a chance to go from one of the worst records in the league to a team that makes a play-in. Only time will tell with this team, but for the first time since James Harden left, there's actual hope for Rockets fans. At the 11th seed, I have the Timberwolves. I know, it seems very, very low for this team, especially considering they have two potential All-NBA players and a really solid starting five. But let's take this analysis off of how we believe the Timberwolves will play, and let's look at how they actually played last season. When Carl Anthony Towns was healthy, the T-Wolves were 15-14, and 14, with the majority of their wins coming against teams who were, at best, 500. There's still the concern of how this team will mesh, and I'm still not confident in their depth 
considering that Troy Brown Jr. and Nikhil Alexander-Walker will be getting 15 to 20 minutes a night. But maybe I'm downplaying this team's talent. Anthony Edwards is one of the NBA's brightest stars, and I fully expect him to break out into an All-NBA guy this season. And as much criticism as Cat gets, he's still one of the 10 best big men in the league. Jaden McDaniels is a really solid defensive weapon, and Mike Conley is still Mike Conley. There's a path where this team is somehow the sixth seed, but in my mind, I see this as a regression year where the Timberwolves will have to look into the mirror and figure out who's getting traded. At the 10th seed, I have the OKC Thunder. There's a lot of reasons to be optimistic if you're a Thunder fan. SGA looks like a top 10 player in the league, Josh Giddy and Jalen Williams look like future key pieces on a title team, and Chet Holmgren, the second overall pick in 2022, will make his NBA debut on opening night. And after winning 40 games last season and making the play-in, there's a world where in 3-5 to five years, this team will be a contender. But in 2023, with a core so young, will they continue to find success? Last year felt like a breakout year for OKC, but this year, I don't see how OKC gets over, at most, 48 wins. In a West stacked with win-now teams, it's hard to rank them any higher than 10th, but don't be shocked if they make a run at a top seed in the next couple of years. At the ninth seed, I have the New Orleans Pelicans. The Pelicans have the lowest floor and one of the highest ceilings in the entire Western Conference. At their lowest, Zion Williamson will not play over 30 games this upcoming season, Brandon Ingram and CJ McCollum will continue to miss games due to nagging injuries, and their young core will stagnate and stop developing, causing this team to bottom out in the West. But at their highest, the Pelicans' top three stay healthy the entire season, their young core starts to step up, and they finish as a top four seed in the West. The odds of either of these things happening are low, but I think they kind of play how they did last season. When Zion's healthy, they'll be almost unstoppable, but when he's not, this team will struggle to stay afloat. So put those two versions of the Pelicans together, and they just barely finish over 500. My question for this team is, what's next? And if they have another disappointing finish to the season, who gets traded? At the 8th seed, I have the Dallas Mavericks. This ranking is banking on the fact that Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving are two of the best offensive talents in the NBA. We've seen both Luka and Kyrie have big moments in the regular season and the playoffs, leading teams with subpar talent to a solid record. But this Mavericks team reloaded on talent this offseason, adding former Maverick Seth Curry and solid big men Grant Williams and Rashawn Holmes. And they somewhat addressed their defensive woes from last season, drafting Jarek Lively and Omax Prosper. But what makes me believe the Mavericks will somewhat bounce back after a disappointing season is that Luka played basketball all summer and will start this season in shape. And with an offseason to develop as a team instead of playing on the fly, I believe this Mavericks team will improve from last season but ultimately fall short of a guaranteed playoff spot. At the 7th seed, I have the Sacramento Kings. Sacktown had almost everything go perfectly last season. De'Aaron Fox took a huge step as a leader and facilitator, DeMontis Sabonis played like a top 5 center in the league, and role players like Malik Monk and Kevin Herter proved to be valuable pieces, as the Kings finished as the third seed in the West. And while I'm still high on this team, it's hard to rank them any higher than 7th. While the Kings offense is elite, they did nothing in the offseason to address their bottom 10 defense. And as solid as Harrison Barnes is, how can they upgrade the 3 position while getting a player that fits their timeline? There are some holes in the Kings that they haven't addressed just yet, and this season, I believe the Kings will hit a bit of a reality check, finishing just outside of the top 6 in the Western Conference. At the 6th seed, I have the Los Angeles Clippers. I made a video about the Clippers a couple of weeks back, and every single one of my points in that video still stands, because I fully believe that come playoff time, either Paul George or Kawhi will be hurt. In each of the past three seasons, the Clippers are screwed because of it, so why is this year any different? The only thing that can make me optimistic about this team is their 2021 playoff run, because even without Kawhi in the Western Conference Finals, they put up a fight against the Suns. In that series, the Clippers proved that their supporting cast can step up when needed, and that was before the addition of Russell Westbrook and Norman Powell, two guys who can put up 20 a night. But the question that remains to be seen is can PG, Kawhi, and Westbrook coexist on the floor together? With this prediction, I'm banking that the Clippers struggle, but still put it together near the end of the season, finishing as the first team in the West with a guaranteed playoff spot. 
At the fifth seed, I have the Memphis Grizzlies. It's hard to rank a team when their best player is out for the first 25 games of the season, and we don't know if that player has learned from his previous mistakes that caused him to miss the first 25 games of this season. But from his talent standpoint, the Grizzlies are one of the best teams in the West. And while they didn't do much this offseason, they pretty much just lost a 3 and D wing and gained a better, more skilled 3 and D guard. I'm a little more concerned on how this team will gel when Ja gets back, and who will play at the small forward position, as John Chanchar is not a starting caliber small forward on any NBA team, much less a playoff team. But we've seen this team defy the odds two seasons in a row, and when fully healthy, this team's starting five is extremely well-rounded. I don't believe they get back to the second seed, but the fifth seed is still solid for a team as young as the Grizzlies. At the fourth seed, I have the Golden State Warriors. I'm willing to look foolish betting on the Golden State Warriors despite all of the obvious concerns. They're pretty much running it back from last season, besides swapping Jordan Poole for Chris Paul, of course, and there's still many concerns about chemistry issues. But we've all learned not to bet against a player as great as Steph Curry, and while this team looks and feels much weaker than the 2022 title team, there's still a championship pedigree within most of this team that elevates it above younger and possibly more talented teams like the Grizzlies and Kings. I'm still not sure how they will incorporate Chris Paul in the game plan, as I don't know if CP3 will be happy to come off the bench. But the main five guys on the 2022 title team are still here, along with Steve Kerr, and I'm willing to look stupid supporting a team that's dominated the West for the last eight seasons. At the third seed, I have the Phoenix Suns. The Suns have gone through some major changes this offseason, moving on from CP3 and DeAndre Ayton, two key players on their 2021 finals run team, and adding Bradley Beal and Yusuf Nurkic. It seems as though this team is going all in on offense, and honestly, I'm here for it. I'm curious to see how Frank Vogel, a coach who is known for his defensive mind, deals with his four best players, who from what I've seen in the past two seasons, are all average to below average defenders. But I can see the vision in Phoenix. When Bradley Beal was a second option in Washington over five seasons ago, he was regarded as one of the better perimeter defenders in the league. And just three seasons ago, Yusuf Nurkic was an extremely underrated post defender. With a reduced offensive load for the Suns' new acquisitions, the Suns are banking on Beal and Nurkic's past defensive performance and hoping they can replicate it. I believe they're going to finish with a top three record in the West, but this team was constructed for one reason only, to win a title. The real question is, can they stop the two teams with objectively more talent than them? At the second seed, I have the LA Lakers. We've seen what this Lakers team can do at the peak of their powers. In this upcoming season, I'm banking on LeBron and AD's health, as well as Austin Reeves' ability to be a third option. But it's not just the top three that makes this Lakers team so dangerous. For the first time since their 2020 title team, the Lakers have serious depth that can complement their stars. I love the addition of Gabe Vincent and Torian Prince as backups, two guys that can defend and shoot at an above average level. This core already made the Western Conference Finals last season. Adding depth might be the last thing the Lakers needed to win an NBA title. They still need to get through Denver to make it to the NBA Finals, but their odds of taking a series from the Nuggets have drastically increased after this offseason, and I wouldn't be surprised to see the Lakers not only finish with the top three seed in the West, but also make the NBA Finals. And finally, at the first seed, I have the Denver Nuggets. It's clear now that Nikola Jokic is the undisputed best player in the league, and the Nuggets still have their championship winning core intact, including Jamal Murray, Aaron Gordon, and Michael Porter Jr. You can't bet against the best player in the world on the team that just won the NBA Finals. And while they lost a valuable piece in Bruce Brown this offseason, I fully expect the player, most likely Christian Brown, to step up and take his role. There's a lot to like about this team as they're one of the four or five teams in the NBA that don't have any glaring holes. I believe this is a 60-win team that will regain their position as a top team in the Western Conference. And that does it for the predictions. Comment below who you think will win the Western Conference and remember to subscribe to see my Eastern Conference predictions. I'm Julian with Talkback Sports and I'll see you next time.